Okay. So hello, we're talking with top marketers and business leaders about how to solve for problems, pandemics, things we don't expect. And we'll talk a bit about resiliency and how to develop it and how to get ready for the rebound. So Raman Koop is a serial entrepreneur and co-founder and CEO of Your Answer, a leader in voice shopping experience. Your Answer serves leading retailers around the world with their breakthrough technology service, providing the ultimate shopping experience on a mobile device. Super exciting to have you here, Raman. You're such a smart man, and I really admire and appreciate the depth and breadth of your experience online. You speak, you're speaking with us currently from South, South Australia, <clears throat> but you speak internationally on a pretty broad range of topics from mobile shopping experiences to voice enabled websites, mobile display talk technologies, novel US technology, <clears throat> I'm sorry, novel UX technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's quite a list, conversion rate optimization to search where you were in back in the day. So it's, uh, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say and to share with people how you and your company are preparing and how you and your team because um, I've seen you make a few pivots. So I know you're someone with a very strong resiliency muscle. You've been through a number of economic changes. So I'd like to just jump into the questions, unless there's anything you'd like to add to that intro. Oh, thank you. Of course. So Raman, what do you see that is now possible that wouldn't have been possible without coronavirus? So it's, it's a great question. Um, and you know, that's, that's sometimes a difficult question to answer because you're thinking, okay, what does this mean? But I, I think, you know, for us, it, it really depends on um, where you are in the world. Um, I've lived in the US, traveled to the US all the time prior to the, the last few months for obvious reasons. And it, it's pretty sophisticated when it comes to e-commerce. And that's one of the reasons we like doing business there and so on and so forth. But not everywhere is quite as advanced. And um, even strangely in Australia, um, some of the department stores, some of the more traditional bricks and mortar stores, big box stores, um, were a little slow to embrace uh, online. And even as recent as a couple of years ago, we've had some of the so-called leaders of some, some of those big organisations in this country explain, uh, in, actually in relation to Amazon coming into Australia. So Amazon believe it or not, um, only came into Australia a couple of years ago. Um, makes us feel like a bit of a third world country here, but you know, it is a country with only 20 million people. Uh, eBay had been here forever and you know, a few others too. Now, you know, some of the leaders of these more traditional businesses were asked, you know, what's gonna happen with Amazon coming? Clearly that's gonna be a threat. And they very proudly explained, no, it wouldn't be. Their big box businesses would be okay. And in fact, one of the leaders said, look, who would possibly buy a fridge online? You would never do that. You know, you have to go and see a fridge to buy a fridge online. And I laughed because I thought, wow, you know, I, I had bought a fridge online literally one month before that. And in fact, I think I bought a fridge online X years before that as well. Yeah. Um, so I just share that story because um, sometimes it's a mindset thing as well, depending where you are in the world. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that in the last few years, even in Australia, a lot of fridges have been sold online. And um, the reality is almost anything can. And, and I remember back to, go back in time now to the year 2000, uh, I was in San Francisco uh, and I was talking to um, one of the big um, search engine directory companies. In fact, it was a company called LookSmart. At the time, I don't know, probably, I don't know if any of your <laughs> listeners remember a company called LookSmart. We'll test your age here and your memory. <laughs> um, but they were one of the early, uh, actually they come from Australia as it turns out, uh, they, they, they come from Australia originally, but they were one of the early um, uh, search engine directories, essentially a competitor to Yahoo and for those that haven't been around long enough, before Yahoo was really a search engine, it was a directory in the mid 90s. Um, and it's a bit scary when it did turn into a search engine, it used uh, people to surf the internet to build up its search engine index rather than sending software out. It's hard to believe. Amazing. Anyway, I, 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 I get a bit sidelined here with some of the old stories, but um, back in the year 2000, um, the chairman of that company, uh, we met in San Francisco 
and you know, this go things 20 years ago, so relatively early days of the internet. And I was giving an example around search and why our technology was so good and pitching him and some, so on. Some silly reason, and I can't remember why, I chose to talk about shoes and buying shoes online. And then I said, hang on, that's crazy. Why would you buy shoes online? You need to know if they fit. Bad example, I'll give you another example. And he said, hey, stop, stop, Rahman, stop right there. Let me tell you, I buy my shoes online. <laughs> this is back in the year 2000. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I already have shoes, go figure. <laughs> I know brands, uh, I know my size and what typically is fitted in the past. And by the way, if there's a problem, you can always return them. I buy my shoes online all the time. Um, and that's from 20 years ago. So I think from way back through now to coronavirus, where we find there are other things we can do online, there are other ways of doing things without face-to-face -face meetings, without physical contact. Um, probably the sky is the limit. Uh, and we've seen that with people purchasing property online, um, sometimes unseen. Um, uh, you know, to buy real estate online, you know, when you think of a bigger purchase in your life and, and anything crazier than not actually seeing it, and yet that does happen with some people. So I think coronavirus, um, it propels us forward and makes us think more about how can we do things without physical contact, and the reality is probably more things can be done than we sometimes initially realise because we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, great points. It's moved us forward and got us thinking in new ways and moved, busted us out of our habits, which is, yeah. is often productive. That, that's right. And, you know, from an internal point of view, um, for us, it hasn't been hugely different just because we're an organisation that's spread across the world anyway. But even so, you still improve some of your systems, um, pay a bit more money to Zoom and some of the other companies maybe, although we were doing a fair bit of that anyway. But um, yeah, you just, you just find different ways of doing things. And, um, you know, many years ago, I'll go back too far in time now, but I think it was almost 30 years ago, we had a massive airline strike uh, in Australia. Um, a very interesting situation. And uh, anyway, the long and the short of it is that all the pilots in this country had their jobs terminated, basically. Um, and it's hard to believe. And I lived through that. It was, it was about 1989, I think, uh, or thereabouts, plus or minus a year. And at the time, you would have thought a country could not work with, you know, pre-coronavirus, <laughs> way back, could not work without uh, flights and pilots. Um, and of course, the technology in relation to video conferencing and the like was not as strong as it is today, but it did exist. Um, and I, along with many others in business, continued to do business way back then without the ability um, to fly internally uh, within Australia. Um, it was an incredible time. It lasted for, it was a good six months of, I think, zero flights, essentially. Uh, and then it gradually ramped up over a period of 18 months or so. Uh, you, and in those early flights, when you, when you got one, the first thing you noticed um, when you know, the, the, the captain <laughs> came on the, on the microphone was he had a strange accent because um, the pilots came from overseas. New, new pilots were brought in from overseas, from all countries around the world. Um, so that, again, is just an example that um, when an event happens, as humans, we just adapt because we have to and we know how to survive. Uh, yeah, that's a great segue. I'd like to talk a, a bit about adaptability or resiliency, you might call it. The ability to bob and weave, to adjust, to pivot. I've seen you do this a number of times just in the your amigo, your answer business, how would you advise someone on how to develop their resiliency muscle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I look back over many years of different businesses and um, often bringing very new products into market where there's not 
an existing use case, so to speak. Um, resilience is really important and persistence is something, <laughs> one of those words that resonated with me 35, 40 years ago. Uh, I think persistence is a, is a, is a huge key to resilience. Um, you know, obviously it's important to be persistent in areas where there's um, some hope, <laughs> you know, some, some possibility and adaptability is very important and, and, and the need to refine and um, uh, reposition and, 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 and so on is critical. So um, persistence, really a key thing. And, and, and I remember way back in one of our earlier businesses when um, we were involved in organic search. And at the time, um, you know, we took a new technology service to market. Um, and it was really a world where the world was search engine optimization. And we were kind of moving into that from a very different angle. Um, at the time, the consultants out there would all charge a fixed fee per month. And then they would report the value of their service, so to speak, based on maybe showing where t 10 keywords rank in, in Google. Um, we um, had a technology that on mass had the potential to help many, many pages and many, many keywords rank. Um, we didn't look to report on ranking, which firstly shocked people. Um, we looked to report on tracking sales and showing the additional sales that came through from, from that. But then the really radical thing, which initially we were told we were crazy about by quite a few people, was to say, we're not gonna charge you a fixed amount per month because um, it's not fair on you. I mean, you know, you pay somebody say 10, $20,000 a month and it's like, I'll oh, just trust us, you've got some better rankings. Um, we're like, just pay us for performance, pay us fairly for the extra value we deliver. And so we incorporated models around cost per click and revenue share, which had never been seen before in, uh, in, in that organic search service world. And when we initially proposed that and spoke to some customers, I was told more than once that I was crazy. <laughs> Are you crazy, you know, charging on a cost per click basis or revenue share for the free results in Google? It was just insane. And I heard that a few times over a 12 month period. And then two years later, I never ever heard it again. Not a single time going forward, you know, for a decade or more. Um, and we essentially changed the industry and we had people saying, yeah, we well, know we only work on performance model. We wouldn't work on any other model. So we, we essentially, and, and we were doing that in the UK, in Europe, the United States, you know, it's not, not just one country. And we were getting similar early responses from, from all those uh, from all those countries, um, but persistence paid off. Where we backed our judgment around that model, we felt it was the right model. We felt that um, it was the model that lowered the risk for our customers and delivered tangible value to customers that would give them ROI positive results. Um, and that persistence and just um, changing the way we communicated it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, you know, we got there. So, um, yeah, I think persistence is really important, but it needs to be in something that has some potential. But yeah, changing, yeah, we've, we've changed a number of things over the years because we learn from our customers, we learn from the market. And, and this is something I've often said, um, you can have great technology, you can have the world's best technology and it's good to have it. <laughs> But you need to understand the requirements of customers, what are important to customers, and how to provide them with, um, typically these days a service, most technology these days of course is delivered as a service. So you need to have a service that meets their needs, exceeds their expectations, keeps the load on them at an absolute minimum, so that um, the vast majority of the work, if not all, is done from the provider's end. And so from the customer's end, it's more about great uh, ability to see results, the analytics, to be able to um, use those analytics to not only um, determine um, you know, the value on the system, 
but to see how that data that comes out of it can be used across the organisation and across other marketing and other initiatives that are being done uh, you know, for better understanding across um, you know, products and so on that are being sold. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's nothing like hard times to build up resilience. And we've seen it during war, unfortunately, uh, and, and, and all sorts of other really torrid times. And people have an amazing ability to adapt, to um, challenge adversity by adaptation and coming up with creative ways. And, and I think it's human nature and, uh, and I applaud it where, wherever I see it. Great. So what I hear you saying, what I heard some of those points in there was to uh, believe in what you're doing, to learn from everything and to welcome hard times as much as possible, knowing that your own human nature is adaptable and creative. Look, I, I think that's very true. And, um, you know, one of the companies that I was involved in um, started in September 1999, and it was a tech company. And, um, you know, a couple of founders, one of them, three of us actually, three founders, <laughs> started that company. And within a few months, the, um, you know, the tech wreck, NASDAQ crash of, memory around April 2000 plus or minus a month uh, came upon us and we you know we're in a phase of just preparing to raise our first round of external capital wow. and um, those were tough times <laughs> we remember them well and then just as we were starting to get on our feet again and we we're getting customers and you know things were we were hanging in there um, Unfortunately, September 11 occurred and we literally had a deal. Um, we had a handshake on a deal uh, the very day before September 11 for uh, a round of funding. Um, and when September 11 occurred, it wasn't obvious to me in those first few hours that that would mean no funding. But as became clear a few days later, it meant no funding. <laughs> um, An experience. Yeah, and we started to wonder, wow, is this going to happen every time that we, uh, <laughs> in those early mm. days, look to raise capital or, 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 or do whatever? Uh, and, and, you know, in some of those times, there were times uh, way back in, you know, around 2001, we had to let some staff go uh, to survive, uh, to, you know, to, to, to still, still be around. And I remember in those early days, we'd travel be over in the in, in US, because I was in the US all the time, because that's that's where the market was. That's where the number one market is. So that's where I wanted to be as often as possible, uh, close to customers, close to partners, close to, um, you know, where, uh, where the real business is. And, uh, you know, this is kind of that past boom from the tech of where there were big offices in San Francisco, you know, dot com, literally dot com companies everywhere that had been partying all the time and celebrating the huge amounts of money they had and the good times. And of course, that all changed relatively quickly um, uh, uh, after the uh, tech wreck, so to speak. And I'd turn up there and I'd meet some people that I'd met before and they'd say, Rama, we're impressed. And I'd say, what are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean you're impressed? Said, no, we're impressed with your company. I said, well, hang on, we're relatively early days. We haven't changed the world yet. Why are you impressed? You're still around. You're still around, <laughs> and, and you know, literally, you hear that a year or two after. Um, it's a fair point. The tech wreck. Uh, and I never thought of it that way. For me, that wasn't impressive. Impressive was getting into a market, getting traction, and really growing sales, uh, and and delivering some great results for customers. I mean, that's for us how we me measure impressive. But it it just points to how tough those times were, and just how many businesses disappeared in a relatively short period of time. And you were acknowledged for your resiliency. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I guess so. Yes, exactly. I, I guess so. And at mm -hmm. the time, you kind of brush it off a bit and kind of laugh about it. But no, you're right. I, I think you're right. It, it, it is kind of... Non-traditional times. Of, of, yeah. yeah. Impressive of, of is not... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And they're, they're very different times. And, you know, COVID's tough at the moment for a number of businesses, no question. Some more than others. Um, and particularly if you're in bricks and mortar and 
travel and you know, if you don't have to go through the list, people know it. Um, it, it is very tough, but, um, but for, there are other businesses that are booming on the online site, you know, particular ones, and so there are winners and losers. But either way, um, whatever's being, being done, resilience, persistence, really important. Great, thank you. How are you and your team preparing for the rebound? What are you doing? What are you not doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we, we've been really, really busy <laughs> uh, from two perspectives. One is there has been quite a demand um, for our voice shopping service. Uh, it's online. It somewhat recreates the physical experience uh, online. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and frankly, there's, there's a very, and I should mention this actually, I think this is interesting. We're seeing a variation uh, across prospects and customers, depending on the particular type of business out there. And, and it really has interested us. We've got a set of customers that are, you know, how much can we take uh, of this opportunity at the moment? Uh, um, you know, this is the opportunity to really grow. Um, voice shopping is exactly what we want. We're looking for new technology. Wow, let's grab it. So we're seeing a back, certain portion that are leaping on it. We're seeing another portion of businesses that are in um, more of a uh, putting out uh, fires mode, you know, I issues everywhere, you know, problem in the supply chain, um, pr problem with bricks and mortar stores. You know, unfortunately, as, as we know, there, there was some riots and problems with um, certain parts of the US with stores and the like and damage and, and so on mm -hmm. to, to stores. So some of those businesses have, have those issues uh, to deal with. Obviously issues of in some cases having to close stores, reduce staff numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So some of them are you know, dealing with a lot of issues. Then we see another group that are what I call a little bit of the deer in the headlights <laughs> syndrome where, wow, now's not the right time. We're unsure. It's uncertain times. Um, we're worried. Um, just not the time for new things. So, you know, we have a, a set of prospects like that. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's a diverse range. There, there are others where, and, and we've had some really interesting cases where, I won't mention names, but where we've had businesses where because of the nature of the business, it literally went from, a thriving business to less than 20% of normal revenue mm. overnight. Um, and I remember one of those circumstances where we had a customer say, look, um, we're just cutting everything. Unfortunately, you know, we've, we've got to cut the service, you know, we've got to stop. And we said, well, look, um, why don't we go on hold? Um, we'll, you know, just close the service down for a while. Let's put it on hold. Let's leave the contract there. And let's see in due course if things improve for you and at least it's easy to get going again if you'd like to we're more than happy to do that so we did that and i was shocked a few months ago when the business came back and said yeah look we'd like to do it again and i said okay, but i would have thought your business is still really tough and they said well yeah we're still a long way down we're massively down but actually your service even though we've got a far smaller customer base now, was really delivering value. And we just want to get it going right now again, if you can, and of course we could. Uh, and that was a huge shock to me. I, I, I had written off that opportunity for at least a year, maybe longer, 12 to 18 months. And within a handful of months, uh, it was back. And it just shows, I think, the diversity in situations out there, different people treating it in different ways. From our perspective, we've been um, doing a number of things that are interesting. Firstly, um, developing more technology again. Uh, we're just seeing more and more opportunities. We're getting more and more feedback about how voice shopping um, is relevant and ties into site search and other on-site experiences. So we're looking at broadening our mm -hmm. capability so we've got a lot of tech development going on in kind of companion products slash widening the experience. Uh, we've got a lot of um, new customers and the like that, 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 that we're dealing with. Um, so there's that going on. And 
just a lot of um, way of expressing it. A, 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 a lot of um, crystal ball gazing, I guess, in terms of future capabilities, um, talking to customers about future capabilities, what they might like. We, we, we spend a lot of time with um, getting customer feedback, I guess, on, on, on anything we do, uh, because we want to get whatever, anything we bring out new from, you know, version 1.0, we want to get it as close as possible to, um, you know, to what to, to what users want and to what customers want. Got it. Okay. So, Raman, how has your job changed in COVID nineteen times? It's gone crazy. <laughs> it's. <laughs> um, I thought I was busy before COVID, and I kind of was. Uh, it went to a new level with COVID. Um, when, when it first hit, um, it was a bit of a put out the fire scenario. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, we had a number of customers that overnight their businesses were hit very hard. And so um, I guess we, we worked with them to help them through that period, essentially. Probably the best way of explaining it. Uh, and there were quite a lot of customers that were in difficulty. And so we we're just spending so much more time um, through our uh, account managers and customer service reps and the like. And of course, when you've got change and whatever, things do bubble up to the top of, you know, how do we handle this? What policies can we bring in? Uh, how do we help our customers? What can we maybe do on payment terms? You know, just all, all these things. And early on, you just don't know how widespread it's going to be. And then literally every day or two, more things were arising day by day in the early days. And you're thinking, wow, when is this going to stop? Um, so, you, you know, has the job changed? Um, more, more hours in the night. <laughs> day was already full and part of the night was full. Yeah, more, more, more hours into the night working. Um, trying to come up with solutions to, because if your customer's got a problem as a supplier, mm -hmm. you know, to a certain extent, we share that problem and look to see how we can help. Um, yeah, I mean, we had social distancing, obviously all that sort of thing in the office, policies. Um, it gets to board level, boards, you know, have to look at, various issues, how to deal with them. So for first things, you know, a lot of policies essentially, um, and, and then implementation of those policies. Um, as I said, the customer thing, um, then looking at remote working where, where necessary beyond you know, the normal that we had in the, in the first place. Uh, yeah, hectic is probably the best word. And, and even now it's, it's kind of busy for different reasons and it's it's largely that demand for you know toy shopping online become more important as i said some of the prospects out of there bringing things forward um it just feels like it's been really busy <laughs> got that what has surprised you i think you know earlier um, I was talking a bit about that diverse range of how customers were reacting to COVID. That has surprised me. Um, I really, I guess, had expected um, a wider base of customers to say, wow, we really have to focus online. We have to put so much more effort into online now. We, we, we need to look at how we can optimise it further, how we can whatever. But I, I was surprised by, you know, some of the prospects out there taking more of the deer in the headlights approach, the, oh dear, what do we do? Now's not a good time to get creative. Now's not a good time to take risk or now's not a good time to change or that, that did surprise me. Um, I, I would have thought these times are exactly the times when you need to look at change, when you need to look at how you can do things better. And, and, and to the credit, you know, quite a percent of the prospects we see out there do take that, that view. But I, I guess I naively thought that most would. 
you know, 90% plus, and it's probably not 90% plus. Um, in, in fairness, different companies have different issues. And, you know, we've, we've I want to say heard stories, not really stories. I mean, we've had feedback from some prospects where they're very much international companies. Sure, they're headquartered in the US, have huge operations in the US, but they still have people globally and all over Europe and so on. And in some cases, they had plans where they had key people in Europe that were going to go over to the US to fill key positions just prior to COVID. COVID hits, can't get them over. Can't get them over to the US. So, you know, there are some things where it's not so much the lack of desire to do something. Sometimes there are just constraints um, of, a, of a travel nature where, you know, getting people between countries uh, affects and, and, and we saw some of that. Um, I think also maybe a little bit of surprise, the length of time COVID is probably going to impact us early on. You really don't, it's all very new. Um, you don't know how long a situation is going to last for. You don't really know uh, how a disease like this is going to continue over time, whether it peters out mm -hmm. fairly quickly or but it, I think it's becoming apparent that it's not going away super quickly. Um, and we, you know, may or may not be relying on a vaccine to um, make big change. Uh, and anybody that wants to predict that time frame, actually, I've got a few here and there try and predict it, I think are crazy. I used to do a bit of work in biotech and uh, drug discovery and the like many, many years ago, uh, 25 years ago. Things have changed over 25 years, but I still follow the space a bit, and um, uh, I think it's not going to happen overnight. It may well be a lot longer than people think. So, you know, on that basis, adapting and um, having a way going forward in your business that's probably planning for more than three months, six months ahead, I think would be very wise because um, we may be looking at a situation that's around for a lot longer than three to six months, maybe looking at years. So I think any work done now that um, assumes this changes around for a while and work practices change and the way you do business changes and, and, and you know, and, and you invest, so to speak, uh, for these differences, I think will probably be, be well spent. Um, one thing I've learned over time, you can't get time back again. <laughs> you can do something later, definitely, but you can't wind back the clock and, 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 and recapture that time. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, so, yeah, that, that surprised me a bit, but we've picked up on it pretty early and, and, and we're assuming uh, life like this for a long time. So in our business, just an example, so we'll talk about something specific in our business. Um, one of the ways that um, we promote our business is uh, through trade shows and the like and conferences. And as you alluded to early, earlier, Leslie, uh, yeah, I've done quite a lot of speaking at conferences, typically multiple times per year. And we yes. have um, people that um, man booths at trade shows and conferences and so on. Of course, that's not happening at the moment and hasn't happened uh, since, um, uh, well, for us, uh, late February. I think we, uh, we had a trade show in March uh, from memory, which didn't happen because the forest just came in and built that conference. So we haven't had a, a conference since, uh, in our case, late February. And that's probably about as late as you could have one, as it turns out. Um, and I'm not expecting one in the near future. Um, those are being done online. Um, I'm not convinced they're as successful as face-to-face as, as -face in that particular case. Uh, hard, hard to get a few thousand retailers uh, uh, online at the same time to uh, listen to somebody speaking like I am now. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the same experience, uh, unfortunately, because a large part of those conferences is the sharing of information between retailers and their interaction with their peers face-to-face, um, -face, you know, Huge opportunity, very hard to recreate online. Um, so we're looking at more novel methods of um, interacting with prospects and getting out there, again, largely online, but through different mediums that we haven't in the past. Uh, and that's a reaction to the fact that we don't expect trade shows to be back again in a hurry. 
Um, so we just adapt uh, some of our marketing initiatives and, and, and so on um, based on that fact. And when they come back, which we don't know when, but when they do fine, we'll be back on the uh, conference trade show bandwagon again. But at the moment, we're assuming it could be a long way off. Got that. Anything you can share about how you're adapting for these novel ways? Yeah, so um, inside sales is one way that we're, we're, we're ramping up. So um, the, um, and, and you know, we, we typically outsource, outsource that work, um, but we work very closely with, um, with another company to do that, train them and have a, a close relationship um, so the inside sales with, um, you know, phone calls and other ways of connecting with customers. We can use LinkedIn a lot more. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a great resource, I think, um, for connecting. Um, we like to do it through valuable information. So um, we're very much into trying to share case studies and real, uh, real customer, and, you know, obviously customers approve that, but, you know, real customer information through case studies that I think others can relate to, you know, rather than a message of, hey, buy this, it's good, or, you know, shiny or whatever, sharing some data that um, shows real life examples, the impact it's had, um, you know, things like sharing the growth in usage of voice shopping. So, and, and this surprised us, I mean, because, hey, we're learning, you know, when you're at the forefront of something uh, and you've brought something in new, you learn along the way, there's no question. Um, and what surprised us, um, you know, it's been the growth in voice shopping that we've seen, um, you know, in the last 12 months or so, 12, 18 months, because we've got customers, we can, you know, we track all the data and share, share it with them. Um, but month on month, the increase in users for voice is incredible. And, you know, we've got situations, and this is one way I like to think about it. So site search on, on, a, on a website, you know, the ability to go and find products on a website through a search box has been around for a long time. <laughs> and you can argue about how long, but 20 to 25 years. 25 years, really. Um, now, you know, the usage of that on a site varies. Depends on the particular vertical. It could be anywhere from 3 or 4% of users through to probably 15 to 20% of users. You know, average is probably... 8 to 10% of users, roughly, 8 to 12%, let's call it that, would, um, would use a site search engine or visitors, if you like. 8 to 12% of visitors would use a site search engine. Um, now, we, we expected that voice would be quite low early on because site search has been around for 25 years. Everybody's used to it. And, you know, in many cases, we've started at 2% 2, 2 or so of users, and we thought, that's not too bad. But, boy, does it grow. And, and we've had cases, I remember one site, where the site search users was steady month on month, five to five and a half percent of users. Uh, we brought voice in. First thing we noticed is voice added to site search. It didn't take from site search. So we started at about 2%. Site search didn't go down from 5% to 3%. Stayed right at 5%. Didn't change. Month on month, it just kept growing. And within about six months, we'd hit the site search level of 5%. And you think, wow, I mean, site search has been around for 20, 25 years. How can something that's only been put out for six months achieve the same level of usage in six months' time? We got to 12 months. We were well above site search usage, way above. And it shocked us. We were delighted. I mean, it was one of those positive shocks where you go, wow, this is great. But we didn't anticipate it. Um, we just didn't anticipate that it would be taken up so strongly. And I think it points to, if you're on a mobile device, you've got a small, uh, tiny keyboard and typing in, um, you know, whatever, it's not easy. Whereas if you could just say what you want, and in, and in our case, you can literally say what you want. You're on an apparel site. I want a red dress with short sleeves um, whatever, size um, size six, um, less than $50. You can say that all in one phrase. And, and in doing that, you're asking for exactly what you want and probably what you'd ask for if you went into a store. Mm -hmm. And you will get exactly that through our system. That's that You'll get exactly those precise results, which, frankly, a site search engine can't do. But you can do it with your voice. 
Uh, and presumably it's that sort of result that's just made this usage go through the roof. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're learning, we're adapting, uh, doing all sorts of things, and it's like a feedback loop. We get information, it feeds back into the system, we learn from it, and we improve or add capability or do whatever based on that kind of feedback loop. Great. Got it. I hear, <clears throat> I hear you about staying in and um, really understanding what the customer needs and like keeping up with technology. There's the great more more and more examples of resiliency in the organization and you you yourself. That's great. How did you come to be so resilient? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, oh look, I don't know. I think sometimes it's in nature. You know, for some people, sometimes for some people, resilience builds through hardship, and there's no question about that. And we you know, talked. To, mentioned very briefly before war and other circumstances. Um, in my case, I, I think it's a little bit in, in, in my nature. Um, just tend to be one of those dogged people that won't go away in a hurry. <laughs> and if I believe in something, um, if I believe in something, I, I, I guess I like to give it my best and I'd like to try really hard to, um, to get an end result. I see it as a challenge. I enjoy challenges, actually, in a, in, in a sense. I enjoy challenges. I get bored easily, and I, I kind of admit that. I do get bored easily. I like to be challenged. And I, I think in a tech company, what I really enjoy is the challenge across so many different fronts of understanding user requirements, trying to find something in a, in a market. You know, you know, it's really hard to find something unique, even though the internet's only well, look, roughly 25 years old from a, from a general usage point of view, and for some people less than 25 years old, but it's hard to find something that's unique. I mean, there's been a lot of venture capital. There's been a lot of great ideas uh, over, over many years, and finding something unique is, is difficult. And so I like that challenge. I like the challenge of taking new business models and finding ways of um, monetizing technology, marketing it, you know, across that spectrum, and, and that's one of the joys, I guess, of, of, of being a CEO. You get the opportunity to kind of dabble a bit across those and, 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 and involve yourself with all the people working in those different areas specifically. Uh, and it's a challenge, but it's also fun. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you go back to the year 2000, 2001 and ask me, gee, was it all fun, Ram? And I'm like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't all fun. And at times it felt like a... Um, it felt like a lot of work for not a lot of return in the really early, really early times. You think, wow, I'm putting in so much effort and we think we're doing all things right, but, you know, just the return back that we feel we're getting out of it. And, and then one day, and it almost happens overnight, you go, hang on, there's incredible amounts of things coming in here and happening. What happened? This feels like it changed in a relatively short period of time, over just a few months, we went from whatever to, you know, the complete opposite of everything happening. And, um, and, and that's, I think, an interesting thing about persistence. It, it's almost like an exponential curve where you do so much work, you know, the old exponential curve, hockey stick, if we like, goes like that. In the early parts of that hockey stick, you're spending so much time and doing so much for so little. And then all of a sudden you hit that kind of tipping point and you go up the hockey stick and it's like, why was it so hard before? It couldn't have been that hard. Look at what's happening now. And I think that's just the nature of an early stage business and getting enough persistence to get up, up into the nice part of that hockey curve, I guess, is, um, is the real key. And um, yeah, no, I, I enjoy challenges and lucky enough to have, Whole bunch of other great people on our team that also enjoy challenges and want to come along for the ride, uh, want to be tortured a little bit along the way, which is good for them, but also be delighted by you know the great results and, and the great feedback we get. Awesome. So I get be persistent about being persistent. I think so. Yeah, I love the word. It's just I feel like it's something I learned thirty odd years ago. Um, and I had some great mentors, actually, frankly, in my really early years. I was very lucky in, in a couple of different places I worked. A couple of great mentors. Uh, learned a lot, you know, over a 
to a three or four year period really early in my career uh, from some very smart people. Um, and they'd say things and so on, and I'd lock them away. Uh, and in fact, one of the other sayings I, I used to like a lot from those really early, early days, don't ask, don't get. Meaning, you know, you think, oh, gee, this, I, 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 this would be really good. Oh, I'm not sure if I should ask that because I'm not sure what the reaction will be. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, don't ask, don't get was something that was taught to me really early on. And I've used it all the way <laughs> throughout the career. I try to share it with many other people, you know, daughters and so on, everything in the family. Because um, I think it's just so true. Um, there's nothing really lost by asking most of the time. But you certainly won't get something if you don't ask for it. Got that. So is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like me to? No, no, it's been a lot of fun, Leslie. Look, I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I want to wish everybody out there the best with the coronavirus. Um, it's, it's, it's very tough. I know it's personally and deeply affected some people in the worst possible way, and I'm very sad about that. Um, and, and I, you know, this is, it's hard to say something to those people that, you know, that can be of any comfort whatsoever, other than to, I guess, give sympathy. Um, for those that, you know, for times going ahead, I, I, I just wish people the very best. Um, for businesses, again, um, it, it's tough for, for some businesses and I don't think the deer in the headlights approach is the right thing. I think in these sorts of times, sometimes you have to be a bit courageous. Um, you don't always get it right. But it's better to have tried and failed than to have just been whittled away by not trying and you just don't make it anyway. You know, that, that's the worst outcome, I think. Where you just hang in there, don't really change much. Things just go down on you, down on you, down on you. And then ultimately you don't make it. Well, that's crazy. I mean, you... you you're far better to have tried something brave, given it a go. If it doesn't work, it wasn't perfect, but you probably weren't going to make it anyway. So um, I just wish people the, the best. Um, uh, my thoughts are to all businesses and people out there. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a really tough time. But I, I like your approach, Leslie. You know, your, your questions, everything around this interview has been, what can we learn from this? Where are the silver linings? What are the positives? How can we improve? That's the right approach, I think, to have when you have a pandemic like this. And, and your questions, frankly, really reflect the attitude. And attitude's, again, something I really believe in. Attitude's really important. When we employ people, apart from skill and capability, which are very important, attitude is right at the top of our list when we employ somebody. Your attitude is great. You look at how can we take the positives out of something. And I think that's a great message that you've delivered. Uh, through your questions, and I fully support that. Thank you, Roman. I appreciate the acknowledgement. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a joy and pleasure and my honor, and will make a difference for a lot of people. Well, Leslie, I thank you very it. much. It's always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's been a bit long, as we said before, since we caught up, and it's more difficult now, but it's great to have caught up online. Uh, thanks again. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I mean, I, I've been astounded by what you've done in your business over many years. As you know, we've known each other for a long time. We've both been in the industry for a long time. Uh, some might say I'm a dinosaur in the industry. I'm not sure. But we've both been in there with a lot of experience, and it's just been so great to catch up. So, again, wish you and your family all the best, and, and thank you very much. Thank you. And you and yours. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. You too.